He's got an ad out if anybody's interested. Let me get these up here. Go to the next one. So if anybody's interested, Jim will fix you one up. He's, he's always, his brain's always going, you know, because uh, you, need to, you need to ride him on more. And then, Sonny, I found a rare picture of Troy. It's an old one. I hope it's clear enough. See what the run says. You remember that, Troy? <laughs> Did you ever get chased with a switch? Oh, uh, yeah. He got caught. You, what did you say, Sonny? I said he got caught with a switch. <laughs> Did you ever deserve to be chased with a switch? No. That's what I figured you were going to say. A little boy was in Sunday school, and the teacher was talking about Adam and Eve and had the lesson and had some extra time. So she asked the little boy, she asked the whole class, she said, draw a picture of what you learned, what you know about Adam and Eve. So she's going around and Jimmy drew a picture, had a car, and people in the car, and she said, well, Jimmy, what is that picture of Adam and Eve? And he said, well, you just told us about Adam and Eve. He said, he said, don't you know the story you just told us? She said, yeah, but she said, there was no cars in the Garden of Eden. She said, he said, yes, there was. She said, no, Jimmy. She said, There's, there, was no, there was no cars in, in, the, in the Garden of Eden. Said, How did you come up with the car? He said, there was a car. You just told us. And she said, well, there's three people and a man in the front and a woman and a man in the back. She said, so what are you telling me? She said, well, that's God driving Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. No. Out of the mind of a child... Um, and that's probably what a child would think. We got a couple of messages. Well, they turn into three or four. What would Jesus do with everything that's going on in the world right now, with all the gender stupidity and uh, the world trying to tell us that everything's wrong in the world? You know, Christians are telling the world that this is wrong, and they say, well, just go ahead and do it. They're telling our kids in schools that this is right and this is right, and they say, no, it's wrong. And parents are protesting. They're saying, go ahead and do it. Um, they just voted their day. They wanted to vote on a parents' rights bill. And every Democrat in Congress voted against it. They don't want parents to have rights to their children. The world's upside down. What would Jesus do? Number one, would we hope that he would be satisfied if he came through the front door? I'm serious. Or the side door. Would we hope he would be satisfied with what we're doing? Any, any comment? Would we? We would, we would hope that by us being here, by him knowing us, that he would be happy with what we were doing, uh, that he would be joyed with what we were doing. What would he understand or say or do uh, if he was here, Not maybe not in our church, but just walking in Bloomington? Let's take Bloomington for example. Little five weekend. I don't know what all happened. I... I myself was glad because I, I didn't go anywhere near the campus. It was cool temperatures. Um, we stopped at McDonald's North yesterday, and I couldn't believe how many students came in there to eat breakfast. And I, I can't, couldn't believe how many were awake at 8 o'clock in the morning. And shorts, t-shirts, it was 39 degrees yesterday morning. I guess they're stupid or don't own, maybe they don't own coats. I don't know. Um... What would Jesus do if he saw what was going on on the campus outside of the races? What would he do with Bloomington? What would he do with Indiana? What would he do with the United States? And it's not just the United States. Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. What would Jesus do? We're going to talk about some things that he did do. We'll think about what we, he might do. In 1896, Charles Sheldon published a book. Uh, which took a little while, you know, took the title from Scripture, What Would Jesus Do? Um, steps that Sheldon, his novel, went on to become, they said eventually it became a best-selling book, and then, of course, several years ago, for a couple of years, everybody was wearing all the jewelry, the wristbands, the necklaces, WWJD. What, what, what would Jesus do? It's something that we need to think about as Christians, and we need to think about it every day, because Jesus did. He gave us rules. He gave us guidelines. Uh, he gave us, he told us examples, and we're going to look at his example first, because that's the best thing. First Peter two twenty one. Or even here in two, um, where we call, because Christ, he did what he suffered for us, 
leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Uh, I said the book was, a, what, what would Jesus do, but this book was called In His Steps. Uh, we should follow in his steps. You've all seen the picture of the dad's footprints. We put it up sometimes at, at Father's Day. And behind it is little footprints, but, and, and then they catch up with the dad's footprints, and there's a little footprint inside the dad's, and another one trying to get to the dad's. And the example of, we've always got somebody trying to follow us. We always have somebody trying to follow us and do as we do. So, if you consider what, as you said, what Jesus did when he lived on the earth, um, we want to follow his example. And in this message, then, of course, there's going to be another one that may turn into four messages. But number one, and there's going to be quite a few things to write down in the back of your bulletins, for those of you who don't know, but Jesus obeyed. Now, obedience. I remember from third grade watching a Jimmy Cricket movie. Miss Rosette was my teacher. And this movie, Jimmy Cricket sang the song O-B-E-D-I-N-C-E. I have remembered that since third grade, and that was, let's see, I was seven or eight, so that means 58 years ago. That's a long time. Right, Ulysses? 58 years ago. Um, that's a long time ago. But I remember that song, and, and another one, e e what? E N C Y C L C L O P E D A. He he Jimmy Cricket spelled encyclopedia, and I remembered it. Uh, fifth grade, we had to, one of our words was anti-disestablishmentarianism. I still spell that. Jesus obeyed. Do we like to obey? I want to be. I want honest answers. Do we like to obey? Seriously. Sometimes. Sometimes that's a good answer. Sometimes we don't want to do what somebody tells us to do. Even as adults, we don't. A spouse wants us to do something. A child wants us to do something. A child's told to do something. They don't want to do it. And this human nature says, don't do what you don't want to do. And the world's telling you, you can do whatever you want to do. Don't worry about what anybody else says. But that's not what the Bible says. Jesus was an example to us. He obeyed. I've said this, I use the illustration many times. Could you imagine being Jesus' brother or sister? You're a perfect little child. You never get in trouble. Mom never yells at you. She loves you more than she loves me. Bill Gates said he came home from school one time, and he said he knew how much his parents didn't love him. He said he came home from school one time, they had moved. He tell him. He was joking, of course. Um, but you can you imagine G being Jesus' sibling? The rivalry. You never do anything wrong. You get away with murder. Nobody ever says anything to you. Well, he never said. Uh, he never did anything wrong in order to get yelled at. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew, and he waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And that wisdom allowed him, of course, as God to do things, but filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Well, that makes a difference. All right. What would Jesus do if he came in here? Would he be pleased with our lives? Oh, yeah. It's Sunday morning. We're a church. Where should we be? In church. Would he be pleased with our lives during the week? Would he be pleased with our lifestyles during the week? A lot of questions to ask, but Jesus obeyed. So he wants us to obey. The Bible says, go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to how many creatures? Oh. To every creature. Now, we can't get to every creature. We support several missionaries around the world who, in Hungary, in the Philippines, in England, they, they, they're able to go places that we can't go. They're able to take the gospel where we can't go. We support Connie, and of course, she's retired now. She was in Africa. Becky's sister. Um, she was able to go places. Um, there were some other girls that she worked with, other missionaries over their families, that they were able to take the gospel to those people in Africa that we can never do. That we can never do. Um, Ulysses is from Mexico. Uh, their family got saved, and he's able to witness and, and take the gospel to his people and friends and relatives that he has that we'll never, never be able to go to. But it says go into all the world. So next we know that he was obedient because, a few things here you see on your slide, 
He became strong in spirit as we just read. Now, our spiritual lives are so important that they should be number one. Am I right? Amen. Now, you're all going to leave here today. As I said, stay for Sunday school day. We're going to have a good message on the bread of life. But you're all going to leave here, and at noon, 1 o'clock, what's one of the first things we do when we leave church? What do we do? We go eat. We go to a buffet, or we go to a restaurant, or we go home. We fix lunch because our elders are saying, hey, I haven't had anything since breakfast. I need something else. I need something to sustain me. So we're going to go eat wherever it is. <laughs> wherever you take Bear. By the way, pray for Bear. He has gout, and he's in a lot of pain. He's having trouble harvesting the stuff and getting things planted. That's why I haven't paid anything the last couple weeks back there. He's got a giant. He's got a greenhouse. Square footage is about... Uh, the whole L side shape of our church, that's where footage is about the whole thing. It's a big greenhouse. Uh, so pray for Barry. He has been able to get up and do things. But every time, no matter where you go, eat with Barry, I don't care if it's a sandwich, I don't care if it's a burger. He says, well, he always says, thank you for the pizza. I don't know why. We get in habits of doing things. He says, thanks for the pizza. Um, but our spiritual lives, we're going to feed our bodies. But our spiritual lives, if they're not up to par, if they're not strong... You could feed your body all you can, all you want, but it's not going to do any good. We have to be strong in spirit. So Jesus was strong in spirit as an example to us. Remember, he was God, but yet he was the Father. He was, he was a human being. Um, he was filled with wisdom. We get our wisdom from the Word of God. The world can give you false wisdom. They'll give you false ideas. They'll give you bad, bad ideas. They will give you bad advice. But God's Word can never give you bad advice. You can read it from cover to cover and never get a bad piece of advice from God's Word. So the wisdom comes in. We have to have God's wisdom. Uh, the grace of God was upon him. God's grace. Could you make it a day I asked, we talked about this Wednesday night. I mentioned it so many times. What if the Holy Spirit came and he said, I'm leaving you for 24 hours. 24 hours. 25, but just 24 hours. I'm gone. I'm out of here. You're on your own. Would you panic? I would. I would panic. I need the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit came upon him, and his grace came upon him. I have to have God's grace to get through each day. He increased in wisdom and in stature. Of course, children, they, they're small like this little one here. It won't be long before, you know, it doesn't take long before they start crawling. And then when they start crawling, they start grabbing. And then when they start grabbing, they start pulling things off of shelves and off of coffee tables. And they start pulling things down. And then they start getting into things that they're not supposed to. Doesn't matter how many times you say no, they do it. But they become mobile. But they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, their fingers can reach the table. And they reach up at the table and they start grabbing things. You've got to keep things back. And then sometimes if it's a stove like ours, you have to take the knobs off the front because then their little fingers can touch the knobs, the gas knobs. So they grow in stature. They, they need to. They're supposed to at the age of three. A child is half their adult height. Average. So Jesus grew in stature. He was no different than anyone else. Um, parents... Imagine what it would be like if your child was sinless. Everybody here that's a parent, imagine what it would have been like. I, but I want to go back. What would it have been like? Now, I'm not saying you were. What would your parents have done if you were sinless? I know better you are, Jim, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but what would your parents have done if you were you know, How would they have done it? Boy, now, I understand. Not every family... Sometimes you have two kids, and one's good as gold, and one's a monster. Sarah said if she would have had Mackenzie first, there wouldn't have been a game. Because Mackenzie was totally opposite. Total, I watched both of them for two years. Gage could be in the back seat of the truck, and I said, Gage, it's time to take a nap. He'd lean his head over, close his eyes, and he would take a nap. No questions asked. I'm, and I'm serious. 
Again, this time take a nap. But I don't want to take a nap. I'm not tired. I'm on my passing. I don't want to go to sleep right now. I want to stay up. I want to, I want to do this all the time. There were times Randy had to get her in the car and drive her around at 1 o'clock in the morning to get her to go to sleep so she'd sleep at night. Total opposite. Same parents, same genes, but total 100% opposite. Me and my brother, I'm perfect, and he's not. Uh, we'll go on. Uh, you, you get the picture. But what if a, a child was sinless? How, how can a parent react? But Jesus was obedient as a man. Now, as a God, he had to, of course. One of Jesus' first steps as he began to go into his ministry was to submit to baptism. Now, this is not a big thing, but it is a big thing. Here's the Son of God. We just celebrated Easter. We're Christians. We celebrated that Jesus is alive. We celebrated that Jesus last week. We had the week after Easter. Our message was Jesus is coming. That's the next event on the calendar. Because we're looking forward to him coming back. But he was a human being. He was God. One of Leon's favorite phrases, 100% man, and he's 100% God. Leon said that over and over and over and over and over. I'm sure Dave heard it when he grew up. But to submit to another human being. He's, he's the Son of God. For his human pride to go to another human being and say, baptize me. Well, what did John say? I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even good enough. I shouldn't even latch your shoes. But he goes to John and he gets baptized. Jesus said, This is my beloved son. I mean, God said, This is my beloved son, and who am I well believed? But he had to submit to someone. When a couple gets married, it's a, it's a, I, I always, uh, I, I was with a couple, I draw two circles, I overlap a circle about 25%. I, that's not a perfect, probably not a perfect percentage, but I always say, this is the male, this is the female, and the two of you have had separate lives. You haven't lived together yet, you haven't done anything, you had separate lives, yeah, and you've tried to, you've tried to impress his future wife, and she's trying to impress you. She, you never see her without her makeup on. Her hair is always done up. She's like June Cleaver, wakes up in the morning with beads of pearl on her neck, and her hair is all fixed. And done, never has to do anything that's what you say. But I say there's this 25% that you have to mold together. And now sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a while because the woman many times says, well, my dad didn't do things like that. And the man says, well, my mom didn't do things like that. Well, I'm not your mom, I'm not your dad. We have to get our own lifestyle. We have to do our own things. Ulysses and Melody is coming up just a few weeks. going to be the one-year anniversary already. And they've had to do some of their own things. That they're, trying, they're starting their own family traditions because, you know, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten years, whatever. There's probably going to be children come along. And they're going to want to establish traditions with their children like we did with ours. So Jesus is here. He's obeying. He's obeying. He's doing what he should. He goes and he gets baptism. Of course, baptism is a picture of salvation. It's the first step we should do, the first thing we should do after we get saved. Um, but Jesus didn't, I have a phrase out here, Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He was the Son of God. But here again, we live by example. It's easier to do something that somebody says, it's okay. You probably all know people. Maybe your parents were ones who smoked, smoked cigarettes, and they told you don't smoke cigarettes because they're bad for you. What does a child think when their mom and dad says, don't smoke cigarettes because they're bad for you, and they're sitting there smoking cigarettes? I asked my parents, I said, well, why are they not bad for you? I remember. Well, it's different. We're adults. You'll, you'll learn someday. You'll know someday. Well, that's not a good example when you're doing something and telling somebody else not to do it. You're doing something that's wrong and you're telling somebody else don't do it. Well, Jesus didn't have to worry about that. He was baptized as an act of submission and obedience. It wasn't to John. Who is a submitting and obeying? His father. God gave a rule. Now, you don't have to get baptized if you if you're not 
God. Saved today. If not today, you go to heaven. Like Alistair Begg explained right after Easter, the thief on the cross. Could you imagine this thief on the cross? Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So he dies, he goes to heaven immediately. And they said, who are you? Well, I, I'm a thief. But what are you doing here? I don't know. They said, well, were you baptized? No, I wasn't baptized. They said, well, do you know anything about salvation? Not much. They said, how'd you get here? I said, well, I don't know. I was on the cross, and there was two other men there. And one of them was Jesus, and I said, I died, and I'm here. Well, do you know about the doctrine of sanctification? No. Do you know about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? No, I don't, I don't know any of those things. He said, well, let me, this angel says, no, let me go, let me go talk to the boss. He goes back and says, I have one final question. He said, how'd you get here? He said, why are you here? He said, Jesus told me I could go. Is that a good answer? Amen. He didn't do all the other things. He didn't get baptized. He didn't go to Bible college. He didn't study his Bible. But the Bible said, accept me as your, heavenly, as your, as your Savior, and you could go to heaven. He said, Jesus said, when were you going to be with me? Today. Not tomorrow, not next year. Amen. Don't go home. You don't have to go home and change your shoes and wash your feet and do all that stuff. He said, today. He did it to fulfill the righteousness of God, which was his righteousness too. He was obedient as a Savior. Did Jesus know when he came to earth that he was going to die? He he knew exactly. Now, if you if you knew you were going to have some harm to you, something was going to happen, if you knew you were going to die today, would you avoid the situation that was going to make you die? Now, I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. I told you. <coughs> if, if, I, if we're still around here, who knows? God can put us anywhere. But if we're here and I have my funeral, I don't want it in a funeral home. My wife knows that. Don't put me in any funeral. There's not a funeral home in this town I want to be in. I want my funeral right here. I told my wife on the back of the casket, I want on there, I want to put on there, I'm out of here. Because I'm not going to be in that casket. My, my body, yeah. This ugly old man will be laying there. But I'm not going to be there because Paul said to be absent of the body, to be present with the Lord, I'm going to be with Jesus. Amen. I'm going to be with the Lord. What about you when you die? I'm going to be with the Lord. Doesn't matter. Jesus was obeying as a Savior. If he didn't die on the cross, John, John 14 31 says, But the world may not know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave as the Father gave me a uh, commandment, even so I do. He said, Arise and let us go hence. The Father gave me some some jobs to do, and I'm doing this. I didn't like mowing the lawn when I was growing up. Maybe some of you do. Maybe that's your joy. If I had a riding lawnmower or a power mower, I may have, but I had one of those real mowers <coughs> called R E E L, not R E A L. Back and forth, back and forth. How many of you mowed with those things? How many wish you still had one? How come your hands went down? You don't wish you still had one? They're nice now. They got them with wheels this big. They roll real easy. They got them with two reels on them. They got a double reel they cut. Ours, was, for some reason, ours was never sharp. And I wasn't old enough to know how to do that, but ours was never sharp. And it'd go over and over and over and over. So then Jesus prayed for obedience to the Father. In his model prayer, Luke 1, 1 2, he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, as it is in heaven, so is it, so on earth. Thy will be done. I asked in the beginning if we like obey. We don't. The human nature says don't do it. It's probably a good thing that you do it once while. What was the slide you had on there last week? Don't ask your wife what's going to be what she's fixing for dinner while she's mowing the lawn. It's a good advice. Would that be good advice for you, Joe, not to do that? I don't think they move along. But don't ask your wife while she's mowing the lawn, what's for dinner, dear? She might mow you over. You might get a haircut that you've never had before. That's not a good, it's a good marriage advice. 
Yeah, there's been some times Ann's had to mow because Jim couldn't, and sometimes that happens, but Jesus prayed for he, he, he obeyed. Look at the next slide. Jesus was obedient to death. Now, of all things he could have skipped, I do not know how a non born again person, a non Christian, can look at life and face death. And I'm serious. Because I am not afraid to die. I don't want to necessarily die today. Our goal is, as probably all of you other grandparents, our goal is to see all of our all seven of our grandchildren saved. That's our goal. We want to see our seven grandchildren born again. To know that they're going to be in heaven with us. We know our two children are. We want our grandchildren to be saved. We want them to be saved. Lily and Lily and Kylie hit it off the last couple of times they were here. Lily keeps asking. She asked me again this morning. When is Kylie going to be here? I told her I'm going to get with her and FaceTime Kylie sometimes so she can talk to her. She wants to see Kylie. I said, it's going to be a couple months summer during school. And they didn't start school until after Labor Day, so they don't get out until like June 20th. So it's going to be a while. Anyway, they're, they're friends. They, 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 Lily keeps asking about Kylie. She wants to see Kylie. They just, they're about to, the, Kylie's a little older, but she's they're just about the same. But death! Before our grandchildren die, before we die, we want to see them saved. I'm not afraid to die, like I said. I don't want to today. I know, because on December 3rd, 1972, at about noon, I went into the pastor's office in St. Louis, Missouri, Victory Baptist Church, 1442, Hudson Road, and I asked the Lord to save me. How many of you did that at some point in your life? Raise your hand. Yeah. I asked him to save me, and I became a different person instantly. Did I become perfect? Absolutely not. Ask my children. Ask my wife. Ask Kylie and she'll say, yeah, Bob's perfect. <laughs> well, I didn't become perfect, but I got changed. Instantly. And the Bible tells him when you're saved, you don't have to go to hell. And death is no victory. The grave is no victory. So I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to die today, but I'm not afraid to die because I know I'm going to be in heaven. My mansion's not ready yet. How long is that going to be? I don't know. My father's house is in your mansion. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive them myself that where I am there, you may be also. Jesus promised. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. We've all made promises that we failed. We, we didn't do it. I'll be there at 7.30 to pick you up when we oversleep and not there. I'll do this for you next week and we forget. I have to use Alexa. I have to use Siri. I have to keep, keep reminding myself, remind you of something else because I'll forget. If I don't put my appointments on my phone, I'll just, doctor's appointment six months from now, it can happen if I don't remember. Now, they remind you too. May 1st, I gotta get a wisdom tooth. I didn't even know that was a wisdom tooth back then. But there's a tiny, tiny, the doctor said last time there was a tiny, tiny hole in the side of the wisdom tooth at the gum line, you can't fill it in. So I'm gonna have to get it pulled. That means that I don't know if somebody had to teach that night, I don't know what's gonna to happen by then. But they've already sent me reminders about that appointment. It's not till a week from Monday. They sent me a reminder two weeks ago. They want to make sure you're there. But I'm glad they're doing that because I would forget. I would forget. So Jesus was obedient to death. He went to the cross. Matthew 12, 50. For whosoever shall do the will of the Father, which is in heaven, it says the same is my brother and sister and mother. If you do what my Father wants you to do, I'm with you. And Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. One last part. Jesus studied. The Word of God, of course, permeated Jesus' life. He, he quoted the Scripture over and over and over and over and over. Of course, who gave the men the words to write in the Scriptures? 
Where did they get it from? The Holy Spirit. The God the Father, not the Son, not the Holy Spirit. Three distinct entities, yet one. So he knew the scriptures. He was part of that. He gave them what to write. But he studied them too. Luke 2.41 The 51 records the story of how Jesus at the age of 12 was in the temple. And he was teaching the scholars. A 12 year old. His parents went on. They went on their travel. They found out where's Jesus. Oh no, I thought it was with you. Brother, sister, are supposed to watch him. I don't know. I, I, it's not my day to keep track of it. Dale Loretta one time went and left church, and Bobby Horton was just on sleep in the pew. They got halfway home to realize they didn't have Bobby. He was here asleep. Abandoned. Shame on you, Dale. Any of us would do that if we didn't, we didn't think about it. Where's Bobby? It's awful quiet. Oh, he's at church sleeping away. There was times our children fell asleep here. One Wednesday night, me and Becky and Brother Mrs. Decker sat here and talked till almost midnight on a Wednesday night. The kids fell asleep on the views. We took them home, though. We took a team trip one time, and Chris, we told Chris Monk, we said, we're going to bring back the same number of kids. We don't know if it's your kids. We're going to bring back the same number of kids. And Chris said, I want my kids back. He said, believe it or not, there could be some worse than mine. We forget. Jesus studied the Word of God. He was teaching them. Real quickly. They were astonished at what he was teaching. They were astonished about the answers he was giving. Look at this next slide. Do what Jesus would do means applying the Word of God. Now, I've said it over and over and over over the years many, many times. If you want to do one of these year Bible studies, do it. I've done it. I've done it in a few months. Read the whole Bible. If you want to do that, by all means, do it every year. Do it. But if you do it real fast every day, you say, well, I read my 17 verses that the list says, and I read my New Testament verses, and I read my Old Testament verses, and I ask you, what did you learn from it? You got it read real fast and say, okay, I got it done. But what did you learn from it? I believe that's more important. Nothing wrong with doing the reading. But well, I believe you've got to figure out what you want from the Word of God. It's our job to study the Word of God. It's your job to know the Word of God. If you didn't know, and I've said it many times over the years, if you didn't know the Word of God, I could be teaching you a bunch of baloney like a lot of these false teachers on television. They teach all kinds of stupid stuff. And people believe them. And they accept it. Because they don't know the Word of God. They don't have a clue what the Bible says. They don't have a clue. It's your job to know the Word of God. It's your job to apply it. You can learn it. Um, if Jesus were living today on this earth, like we said, in the flesh, what role would the Scriptures be in his life? He would quote it like he did then. Would he study the Scriptures? Of course he would. Would he come to church? Of course he would. To be like Jesus is to be immersed in the whole Word of God. This Bible that we have is not just a book. It's the only book that you possess that's alive. It's real. Yeah, there's a lot of good books. I have over 500 books in my office. And I use them once in a while. Not every one of them. I've never, I, there's books I've never gotten into. Like I told our professor at college who went to the Lord a few years ago. They asked him one time we were in college and the college paper said, do you, do you read all these books? He said, no. He said, they're tools. Joe, do you have tools that you don't use all the time that you only need them once in a while? Jim, do you have tools that you only need once in a while and you don't get them out all the time? Tanya, did you have hair cutting tools that you didn't use all the time? Sure. 
We don't use every tool all the time, but when we need them. Now, the older I get, the harder it is to find them. <laughs> I know I got it. Well, I can't say that. Because some things are gone because of children. So a few years ago, we started buying Ryan and Randy tools that they borrowed from me. So I could get mine back. Christmas presents, you know. Then I got my tool back. I don't use all the books, but they're tools. When I need to look up a certain thing, I can pull down a book, and I got my books. I don't have them. Some people put them in numbers and everything else. I've got them by subject matter. So theology books are together, history books are together, English books are together. They're all together, so I know where they're at approximately. But I can pull them out, and if I have to look up something, I, I know where to go. It's a tool. But the number one tool is right here. I preach from this Bible, but I, uh, my desk, I've got a study Bible. This Bible, this Thompson chain, has a lot of notes in the back of it, but the study Bible has different notes in it. And I use that all the time because it gives me what I need. The last thing, look at this last slide. We cannot, capitalize cannot, if you write it down, we cannot, we cannot immerse ourselves in the Word uh, if we are satisfied where we are at right now. Because the world says, forget the Bible. You Christians, you're crazy. I told them last week I saw a video. The FBI just admitted that they are infiltrating churches all over the United States. Because Christians are the enemy of the state. If the Lord doesn't come, you better be praying for our country. Am I right? Because if the Lord doesn't come, we may be told sometimes that we can't even come to church. We may be told we can't preach this and that. We've got a corrupt government. We have a corrupt world. Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, but he wants to shut us down. Almost every church I know, every pastor I know, said they lost people during COVID because people were afraid. Instead of using their faith, they're afraid to go back to church. They'll go to ball games and sit there with 50,000 people. They'll go downtown to an event. They'll go to a restaurant with all these people, but they won't come to church because they might get sick. It's an excuse. We have to immerse ourselves in the Word of God, and if we are happy where we're at, we're not immersing ourselves because we can't stay in this world. We can't be like the world. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. So what would Jesus do? Let's stand with eyes bowed, heads bowed, eyes closed. We're not going to have a piano. We're not going to sing today. Just a challenge. If Jesus came up to you and watched you this week, what would he think about you? What would Jesus say? So we are supposed to be like him. We always pray before we leave our church and we ask God to... Put somebody in our path that we can be a testimony to. We can pay something forward. We can be a testimony of the Word of God. We can invite them to church. Christian, what can you do for the Lord? As far as I know, everyone in this building is a born again Christian. Except for the little ones. So, Father, I'm going to ask you today to challenge all of our lives. Mine included. What can we do for you? How can we serve you better this week? We do ask you to put somebody in our place, in our, in our path. Not by circumstance, not just by happenstance, but put somebody in our path that we can be a testimony to. We can say, hey, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know that Jesus can help you? Father, use us as your children. Use us in a mighty way. And all God's people say, Amen.